after sunset on the evening of November 5, 1975. A seven-man crew was piling into a four-wheel drive vehicle after finishing a day of woodcutting near the tiny northern Arizona community of Snowflake. One of the seven men was Travis Walton, whose curiosity that night plunged him into a living nightmare he would never forget. Just before leaving the work area, the men in the Jeep watched a glowing object emerge from behind the trees. Travis opened a door to get a better view and continued watching, stunned with his companions. The thing was about uh, 90 feet away, about 20 feet in diameter, about 8 feet high. It was, it was uh, glowing, uh, a golden color, kind of like, like molten metal. I couldn't hear anything at first. It, it must have been because when I got closer, I could, I could hear it. But uh, it was a high-pitched uh, intermittent sound and a low rumbling sound. It sounded like machinery or, you know, a heavy mechanical sound. Very difficult to describe. Travis got out of the vehicle and moved toward the object, despite cries from his friends for him to return. Walton assumed by the time he could get any closer, the object would be gone. Just as I got up close, it started to move with a sort of a rocking motion, kind of like a spinning uh, top, you know, like when it's slowing down to fall over except it it didn't wasn't spinning it the same side stayed toward me and uh, when it started to move it started it got real loud and that, that really scared me and I jumped down behind the log and uh, I, I looked up at this thing and uh, I, I decided then I was in a lot of danger and I was going to get the, the heck out of there and I raised up to go it's the last thing I remember I raised up and I started to turn and uh, I was just about in a high crouch when, when I felt a numbing shock hit me. Um, it I, it kind of like in the head, and I went out. I was uh, knocked unconscious. His six co-workers, however, saw what Travis had not. A slender beam of intense light which shot from the craft and lifted Walton off his feet, knocking him to the ground. The rest of the crew sped away in panic, looking back to see the craft take off. But when they returned to see if Travis was all right, he was nowhere to be found. When Travis finally came to, he was weak, groggy, and in pain. Above him was a light. He assumed he was in a hospital bed, but as his blurred vision became clearer, he discovered he was wrong. I uh, felt something pressing on my chest. My shirt and my jacket were pushed up, and there was this... Um, thing laying across it. It was about four or five inches thick. The thing extended down over my rib cage and down to my belt. And uh, when I looked up and I saw this thing, it, it was gray. And I looked past the edge of it and I saw something white. My eyes weren't focusing real good. And at first I thought it was a, a doctor, you know, white mask and cap and but when I got to where I could see, I, did, I saw this thing, and I just came unglued. I, I looked around me, and there was, there was three of them. I just panicked. I became hysterical. As his eyes became accustomed to the surroundings, Travis saw his captors in more detail. They were about four feet ten. Um, had very large heads. Uh, no hair on their heads. Um, no eyebrows. No... No whiskers or anything like that. They uh, had very large eyes. Uh, those eyes are something that really bothered me more, worse than anything. Uh, the rest of their features were small. It was like small ears, small nose, small mouth, or hardly any lips if they if they had any lips. I never saw them open their mouth. But uh, they were wearing a long coverall type things. They were orangish tan when I saw him I I, st I struck out I just well I wasn't really a, a blow I was so weak I I pushed this one on my right and he fell back into another one but they felt kind of uh, marshmallow -y. <laughs> kind of like like fat you know whereas you know when you push against somebody with muscle it, it feels differently but they seemed light unexpectedly and I jumped off the table there and staggered over into the corner there was a bench across the wall and I, I leaned there 
I was really weak, and I was, I was so scared, you know, I was shaking, and, and they uh, started towards me. And I started just screaming at them, you know, telling them to keep away from me. And uh, I reached over and I grabbed a thing off of the table. There was some bunch of things there, and there was a clear tube about uh, maybe an inch in diameter, I don't know, a foot and a half long. And I thought, uh, it wasn't heavy like glass, and it was too light for a club, and so I wanted to defend myself, and, and so I hit it against the table to, to break it, you know, maybe get a sharp point, but it, it didn't break. But I lashed out at them with it, and I kept screaming. They, did, they only took a couple of steps, and they stopped. After the creatures departed, Travis left the room through the same door, but went down the hallway in the opposite direction. I came to a doorway on my right, and I went into this. Oh, I didn't go right in. I looked in, and it was a round room, a domed room, with a chair in the middle. And uh, it was really funny about this this room. It's really strange. It looked like, you know, I could see the walls and everything, the same as there were everything else in that place. It was all just this matte gray metal look. But when I went towards the chair, I didn't go to the, towards the chair right away. I, I walked around towards the side because the chair was high-backed and I was afraid that there, were, there might be one of those things sitting in that chair. So I went around there and when I could see that there was nobody in the chair, I walked over to it. But the closer I got to the chair, the darker the room seemed. And I could start seeing points of light like the stars. There was buttons there. And I did a stupid thing. I, I pushed some. To, you know, hoping to open the door or something. But uh, when that didn't work, well, I got scared of doing that too because it made the, the, the stars move. I turned, and there was a man standing in the door I came through. And this guy, I mean, it, he appeared human to me, you know, which was a big relief. And I ran up there and started asking him all kinds of questions and just uh, smiled kind of tolerant like and I uh, I assumed that maybe he couldn't hear me because he had the helmet on his head a clear helmet and so when he motioned for me you know, he took me by the arm I went with him I assumed I was being rescued Travis was led out of the craft and into a large hangar where more human like figures were present he remembers their appearance this way they'd pass you know on, on the street but they had a strange thing to their eyes. They were a light color, light, a golden hazel, you know? And they had a resemblance to each other, like a, like a family, but not identical. There was one of them that was a woman, I could tell. Had longer hair and a female shape. The, one of the men and, and the woman came over there and they put me on the table and uh, they put a mask over my face and I started to resist and they held me on the table and they put this mask on my face and, and I reached up to pull it away and before I could, everything went black. Meanwhile, the other members of the woodcutting crew had reported Walton missing. Local police organized a search party but no trace of Walton was found. The next thing he remembered, Travis was lying on the side of a road outside Heber, Arizona, 12 miles from Snowflake. When I first regained consciousness, I was laying on the roadway, well, to the side of the road, more off than on, and uh, my head was on my arm, and uh, I saw a light, and I, I looked up in time to see it go off, which I think was either a light going off or a hatch closing, perhaps. Um, then I saw that this object hovering there, it was a uh, flattened uh, sphere. I mean, it was shaped like a disc, but it was very uh, shiny, chrome-like. I could see that reflecting the, everything around there, but not giving off any light. It was dark. And it was just it was just there for a second, hovering about four feet off the ground, and then it just shot straight up. It was incredible how quick, without making a sound. Travis staggered to a phone booth to call his family, who at first did not believe it was really him. But once convinced, they came to take him home. On the way, Travis received yet another shock. We were riding back in, and they said something about everybody being worried about me. I can't remember the exact conversation, but I said, well, you know, it must have been a bad couple of hours or something to 
reference to time or something like that. And they said, Travis, you've been gone for five days. While recuperating, Travis was able to remember most of what had happened to him. A series of hypnotic regressions with Dr. James Harder from the University of California, however, enabled Walton to recall things with less anxiety and more detail. 